<laughs> everybody this is Rigi together with Hemix we have special guest again with our podcast platform we started recently Martin Adamek today he will be talking about micro RM TypeScript based ORM so hello Hemix hello Martin hello okay hello everyone my name is Martin, and I'm the author of Micro ORM, an object relational mapper for Node.js written in TypeScript. In this presentation, I will try to run through the basic concepts of how it works, as well as touch some of the more advanced features like TypeSafe relations. Let's start with what Micro ORM actually is and how did we get here. Micro ORM is a data mapper based on existing tools like Doctrine in PHP or Hibernate in Java. I'll share an example of what it actually means in a minute. For now, let's just say that it uses so-called change set based persistence through the unit of work pattern. This in turn unlocks optimizations like query batching. It supports several SQL dialects like Postgres or SQLite, as well as MongoDB. It's a code first framework, so you design your entities in code and they serve as the single source of truth. Last but not least, it is strictly typed as much as possible. And there are some nice improvements for the upcoming major release I will share at the end. Here is a quick summary of the micro run features like implicit transactions, dry entities, migrations, schema diffing, seeding, or automatic batching. So how does an entity look like? There are several uh, ways to define the metadata. We can use the decorators together with so-called reflect metadata plugin. This allows to infer simple types like string, number, or date from the TypeScript entity definition, but it fails on stuff like optionality, which needs to be set explicitly. A better alternative to that is using decorators with TSMorph, which is a library wrapping the TypeScript compiler API. This allows to infer any information available to the type system including the optionality, interface names, or union types. Downside is that it brings runtime dependency on TypeScript, which means bigger server-side bundles. It is slower, but the results are cached, and the cache can be warmed up through the CLI. So performance-wise, it is OK. Third approach is an explicit one. You can use the class, uh, the entity schema class, which will allow you to define the metadata separately instead of mixing it into the entity class with decorators. Now back to the chain set based persistence. What does it actually mean? The entity manager maintains an in-memory state of how the entity looks like when you load it from the database. Then it lets you synchronously mutate the entity state. And when you call flush, it will compute all the necessary queries to synchronize the database state and run them, group and batch. Here is an example of that in action. We load the user entity, populate its card collection and address relation. Then we make some changes to the entity graph to various entities. And lastly, call the flush. Notice that we are awaiting only the load and call and flush calls. The rest can be synchronous. As a result, we get three update queries and one insert query, all inside an implicit transaction. We can see the batching here too. There is just one update query for the entity type modifying all three loaded instances at once. That's nice, isn't it? So quick recap of what micro ORM was and how did we get here? It started as a pure experiment somewhere between 2017 and 18, a few months after I made the switch from PHP to Node.js. I wasn't happy with existing tools by the time, but never really wanted this to grow so much. In the end, it was just a toy project. Initially, it was vanilla JavaScript, with entity definitions being driven by JS.comments. comments. This initial version was a pure, pure bookshelf project. It never saw the daylight. It never reached GitHub. It never reached NPM. Later in 2018, I ported it to TypeScript and tried to integrate it to one of the projects I've been maintaining by the time. We were working with MongoDB, so it was the only supported driver by that time. And that imposed some constraints. Like there are no joints in Mongo, so populating of relations had to be done through separate queries, one per type. 
Then after some time, this guy called Turgi came to the GitHub issues and asked, why does it have so low popularity? By the time the project had like 10 stars on GitHub, he suggested a few improvements in publishing an, an article about it. And that's where the real journey actually started. For next few weeks, the project became an obsession. And in less than a month, version 2 was born, which added support for SQL drivers and introduced so-called request context helper, a way to transparently handle context separation for parallel requests. I will get back to that in a minute. Next big step was version 3. It had refactored SQL support, now based on Next.js, a well-established batteries included query builder. This introduced type safe nested queries, support for migrations, schema defining, entity generator, and so called custom map types, a feature that allows you to map database values back and forth to anything you want. It's very handy for value objects or geometry types. Later that year, another major landed. In version four, the project was split into several smaller packages. Uh, the event system was greatly improved, namely the very powerful on-flash event was added, which allows you to modify the flashing, how the flashing works internally. This release was another huge step towards strict type safety, as it introduced type safe relation. I will get, I will have some examples about that in the end of the presentation. Up until now, I was mentioning only major releases, but there is one minor that is worth mentioning. It's the version 4.1 which was a huge performance-oriented release. It enabled automatic batching of all query types for all drivers, as well as employed so-called just-in-type compilation for hydration and snapshotting. I won't get into the details, but let's just say that the result was a very a much faster ORM than it was before. Here, is a, here in the screenshot, you can see a simple benchmark that runs basic create, read, update, and delete operations on 10,000 entities. And that brings us to the current stable release, version 5. It doubled down on type safety, bringing it to more options, including populate and partial loading hints and order by. It also introduced auto flushing, a feature that protects you from querying the database when there are in memory changes that could affect the query. I'll mention that in a second. But enough of history lessons. Let's take a look at some features. First, let me mention the constructors. Internally, MicroORM never calls your entity constructors when creating managed entity instances, with those loaded from the database. This basically means that the constructor will be called only for entities that will trigger an instant query, which in turn means we can use property initializers for runtime default values. Constructors are a handy way to enforce valid entity state. Looking at this example entity, we accept the title and outer entity reference. Now, what if we wanted to accept just the foreign? For that, we have a real helper that allows you to create unmanaged entity reference without having access to the entity manager. Later, when the owning entity becomes managed, the reference will be synchronized in the context. Another important but a bit hidden feature is propagation of changes to bidirectional relation properties. Say a book has one outer, an outer has many books. Now, if we set the value of the outer property on the book side, it will automatically appear on the inverse side, which is the one to many collection and vice versa. This works for all kinds of relations, including many to many. It is especially important as microRN tracks changes only on the owning side of the bidirectional relation. But thanks to the propagation, we can still work with the inverse side and the updates, which will update the owner for us. In other words, we can work with uh, one to many collections and the changes will be propagated and of course stored to the database. Now, back to the auto flash feature I mentioned earlier. I already said this guards you from querying the database before flashing. Let's look at the example here. We create new author entity and mark it for future persistence. Now, if we query the author entity, the ORM will first check if there is some scheduled changes for this type, and it sees the new A1 entity, therefore it will flash. 
so it can be returned in the final results. And this is not limited just to new entities. Managed entities are also tracked. Uh, also, <coughs> changes to managed entities are also detected and will also trigger flash. This feature is enabled by default, but it is configurable both globally and locally, and you can opt out of it on property level as well. So how does it actually work? As you might have guessed, this required, requires prototype modification, which happens during the entity discovery. We need to do it on prototype level, so it works for the new entities as well, not just for those created by the entity manager. A hidden entity helper object is created for each entity instance, and all properties are redefined with getters and setters, so we can, so we can detect the changes and handle the propagation. This hidden entity helper object is worth more attention, as it provides handy methods like init to object or assign. You can access them through the helper or wrap functions, or by extending the base entity class provided by the OR. For managed entities, this object also holds the snapshot, which is then used for change of computation on Flash. And it also holds the reference to the entity manager, which can be used for lazy populating its relation. So, how does it work when it comes to parallel requests? Node.js apps are long running and single app instance can handle many requests in parallel. So we need to have a separate context, a separate identity map for each of them. MicroORM disallows working with the global context and requires you to use a fork, which is basically a copy of the entity manager with its own context. We can't use the global context as it could cause inconsistencies as well as memory could grow indefinitely. One way to deal with this is forking explicitly and either passing around the fork instance in parameters or attaching the instance to the request object. But it can get tedious pretty quickly. Alternative to that is so-called request context helper, which allows you to decouple the context creation from context usage and allows you to just work with the global entity manager instance as long as it happens inside the context handler. It uses the async local storage under the hood to track the context throughout async calls. You can use that in a middleware that is executed before all your requests, and it will create the forks there. They will be attached to the current async call, and, uh, <clears throat> and the global entity manager will then use them automatically. This unlocks easy use of a dependency injection containers where you can keep your global instance of entity manager or entity repositories. To better understand how this works, let's see the find, uh, let's see how the find call gets interpreted. So the find method is context aware. First uses the get context method, which then uses the request context helper to get the right, right entity manager for. So while you work with the global instance of the entity manager, in fact, it gets resolved to the fork found in the async local storage. Maybe, isn't it? But it's very handy. Note that the same mechanism is internally used also for explicit transactions. We are approaching the final part of the presentation. Let's talk about types. First things first, creating entities. While you can use the entity constructors manually, it can get a bit verbose. For that, Entity Manager provides create method, which accepts a whole entity graph, and it can create entity including all its relations in a single step. This method is synchronous. It only creates the entity instance and marks it with future persistence to fly. It validates required properties, both on type level and during the runtime, and dissolves use of unknown properties. Here in the middle example, we see a correct call that defines all required properties and type checks. On the left side, typo is detected. On the right side, missing email property causes a compilation error. Queries through the entity manager are also type checks. In this example, we see a string being used in place of a number, which is detected and causes compilation failure. I already mentioned the populate hints. They are also type safe and support nesting via dot paths. 
Now the same popular him, populate him is also kept on the return type. The find method actually returns a loaded type, which respects the hint. It automatically adds special door sign properties to the loaded relations. This example shows a user with loaded books collection a published relation. You can use the dollar sign on both places to ensure they are loaded. If we omit the populate hint for publisher, we see compilation failures. And if we omit the populate hint completely, we can just we get just the plain outer entity back. For this to work, we need to grab the relation properties. So instead of an outer property defined like this, we need to use scope called reference wrapper. This is an opt-in feature. We need to enable it in decorator options. The ORM will then hydrate the relation wrap into this reference class and force you to either populate it to have this magic dollar sign property or use an async load method, which will ensure the relation is actually loaded before you put this. And finally, a little sneak peek to the future. In the next major version, partial loading will be also type safe. In this example, we can see only the book's title and author's email will be available, plus the, author, or plus the primary keys. Those are selected automatically. This is already implemented, and you could try it out on the stack blade thing. So let me close this by saying that you can't have runtime errors if your code doesn't compile. <laughs> and all right, that's it. So thanks for listening, and now is the time for questions, I guess. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Uh, you can start. <laughs> uh, uh, I need a little bit of time, but uh, okay. yes, I have uh, some questions. Uh, maybe uh, the question not so technically. Uh, as you present, uh, there was uh, one question. Why is not uh, your uh, framework so popular? And uh, you get some hints, some uh, articles. Uh, what I s uh, heard, uh, uh, some help with uh, articles. Uh, and some things changed. Uh, and you started uh, more working on uh, that framework. Uh, and I think uh, it's a great uh, fuel for uh, someone uh, if have some uh, great uh, response from a audience and uh, the motivation is uh, going up. And uh, as I saw a uh, lot of new re releases uh, coming and uh, my mouth are just uh, stay open because uh, <laughs> uh, the new release uh, brings uh, some great uh, new stuff. And uh, my question is, maybe it's time to rename the project because micro RM is not uh, as micro as I think, uh, but uh, typo <laughs> REM is a great name for the next release maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally true. Yeah, yeah, like you know, the in the old times, the very first project I published it was also a Node.js project, and it was called um, Micro oh, Micro Config, and it was like a sh small wrapper around configurations in JavaScript files that were possible to switch based on the current environment. So you can have production config and local config, something that you can get by default in many frameworks from PHP. And that was like, yeah, I came from Neta, you know, so like, where is this? And I had to write it myself and like, yeah, what, what will be the next name? And it was micro something. And it was again, micro something. So yeah, that's indeed not the right name. <laughs> At this time, definitely. By that time, maybe, because it was a much smaller project. I, I was checking the GitHub history, actually, and it was really like 10 files. Now, now it's more like 1,000 files, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, probably not 1,000, but a lot of them, especially in the tests. <laughs> yeah, so maybe it's time to rename it also because it's hard to pronounce. <laughs> Just Thank don't you. name it soft. Because the name is already stolen, <laughs> Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. As I saw from the examples and from sources you presented, you said it is inspired by Nextras ORM, but for me, I can see more clearly inspiration from Doctrine. Is it like... Uh, 
it, was that your path? Like PHP developer coming to Node.js? Yeah, yeah completely. Well, I'm not like missing this. Yeah, like f- funny, funny note about the next trust mention. I, I edited this like those five, six years ago when I was really like literally building the project and thinking how it should work. And I never used Nextrust or MySL, but I was going through the documentation and I liked what I saw. And I started copying the tests and started making stuff work similarly to that. And the, the entity definition in the JS dot, the, the original one that was never published, that's what was inspired by them. But other than that, it was more about doctrine because that was the tool I was uh, comfortable with before I made the switch to Node.js. And how is community comfortable with these decorators in TypeScript? They are still experimental and sure. people around Node.js are more like, oh, use functional programming everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's true. They are controversial, but there are like many people who really like them. And as I said in the beginning of the presentation, there are several ways to go about the entity definition. And the, the entity schema was added because of uh, many people didn't like the decorators. And uh, just a short note, the decorators are actually maturing uh, the new version, the ECMAS decorators. So yeah, this, this is still using the deprecated old version, but they are not dead, and I guess they will be more alive once the new uh, ECMAScript uh, modules will become more widespread. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I must also applaud to the release cycle. I can see release of new a, a new version every other week or every week. So how do you manage to do so much? <laughs> I ask my girlfriend, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, like it's an obsession. It was an obsession before and it's still an obsession. And like in last two years, I started getting some donations through the GitHub sponsors, which was another booster for this. So it's like, yeah, I still, I'm still getting the energy from outside, which drives me. And of course it's a project. It's my baby, you know, I know it inside out. So it's often quite easy to fix those things if you dedicate two hours to it. Like the pain point is rather discussing how to reproduce it rather than fixing it. Yeah, and I, I kind of hate to see bug reports that are open, so. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have some kind of, you know, fella? That is also involved as you, like David Grudel from NetTech mm-hmm. community has this guy Philip Prochaska mm-hmm. and Jakub Vrana. They was like community leaders somehow. Do you have some kind of guy like that? <coughs> Not at all. Like the, in the in the old days when the version two came out came out live, I was trying to. Uh, convince some of my uh, former colleagues to invest in this. But yeah, well, <laughs> nobody likes to work <laughs> alone for free, <laughs> only me. <laughs> so maybe some help is <laughs> to be to be needed. Yeah, and probably you are open to any, any help that will come. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, like the problem is that the project is quite complex and it takes time to onboard somebody. But yeah, it's like over time, there were some contributors. There were some of them that even tried to push some uh, more complex changes, but it usually like um, ends up in like, let's say void. You know, you get one or two big features and then you basically ask them how to maintain it because they don't have the time anymore. I even had to take over one of the projects that were like child project for uh, integration in the NestJS because the authors just stopped responding. So it, it usually works the other way. Instead of onboarding people, I just need to maintain oh. their stuff. <laughs> I get it. Yeah, but like my doors are definitely open. 
I have a small question about uh, presenting uh, your uh, OEM uh, on some uh, conferences like Nordic JS or Berlin JS or some type of these uh, events. Uh, I think uh, it's a great opportunity to present uh, this uh, OEM to biggest audience. Are you thinking about it or it doesn't matter? Mm -hmm. I'm working <laughs> on night uh, and uh, I don't want to travel and speaking. Well, like, you know, th this presentation we are having was a big step forward for me. And yeah, like I, I would much, um, I would like to envision this, but I probably not yet in the, not yet prepared to push it myself, but maybe it will come, maybe. Well, well maybe we will host you on some of the Posobotas or something like that. So for me, thank you, Martin, and good luck with your uh, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. The name is already there, but as you said, the new name will come soon, maybe. <laughs> Doesn't happen with the people. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your presentation and nice, nice talking to you. Okay, thank you.